next lecture. And uh, the next lecture will be uh, with uh, Professor uh, Dr. Rafat Abdelazim, a former head of the Department of Technology Intensive Care and Pain Management in the Faculty of Medicine, uh, Ancients uh, University, um, Cairo, Egypt, from 2013 to 2018. <coughs> he was born in 1955, uh, MD degree in anesthesia and ICU. Uh, in December 89, professor since February 2000, published 25 scientific papers in the field of anesthesia and intensive care till date, supervised and reviewed more than 250 uh, MSc and MD theses and theses in the field of anesthesia and intensive care till date, reviewer of the scientific promotion committee since 2012 till date, and former associate editor of the Egyptian Journal of Anesthesia from 2001 to 2004, former co-editor-in-chief for Ancient Journal of Anesthesiology, reviewer of Egyptian Journal of Anesthesia, Ancient Journal of Anesthesiology, and the Egyptian Journal of Intensive Care and Trauma. Pre uh, president of the first 2014 and second 2015 Ancient International Annual Anesthesia Conference, actively participated in national and international conferences since 1981 till date. So please. Please welcome uh, Zim. You have the mic. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you for the organizing committee for this uh, great effort. Uh, and uh, Ramadan Karim, and welcome to uh, everybody here sharing in this uh, very fruitful uh, course. Thanks for uh, Professor Dr. Saad Mahdi for his uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, this topic of uh, mechanical ventilation in ICU or principles or basics of mechanical ventilation in ICU is too big to be summarized in only one session. So I will start only for the part one. I will uh, be, uh, I will promise you to to have a second or uh, and third uh, session later on, inshallah. Can you see the presentation? And, and now, uh, I will try to uh, summarize as uh, much as I can because uh, it will take too much time. Uh, regarding management of uh, patients with the spread failure needing mechanical ventilation, we have to start uh, a step before mechanical ventilation. Uh, first, to introduce the display of the uh, ventilator, uh, as everybody knows, it uh, consists of two sets of uh, numbers and one or two or three sets of uh, graphs. Uh, regarding the graphs, uh, I will try to introduce uh, another presentation for how to interpret the graphs. Now, the, regarding the numbers, we have preset values or settings. I will talk about these settings later on. And measured values of whatever we are giving to the patient and how the patient is responding and the alarms. Uh, for any patient with respiratory failure, we have many uh, uh, steps of treatment, uh, but we will concentrate only for the, these steps of uh, oxygen supplementation. Uh, uh, after failure of oxygen supplementation, we will go to the non-invasive ventilation if it is possible or feasible or jump to the endotracheal intubation and the mechanical ventilation. What is inside the, the red uh, box is uh, what we mean by mechanical ventilation. If we introduce uh, invasive non uh, mechanical ventilation, if we, we uh, intubate the patient, that we call it in, uh, invasive or mechanical ventilation or invasive mechanical ventilation. What is non-invasive is using a face mask or nasal mask to ventilate the patient non-invasively. Uh, oxygen supplementation aims at increasing the PO2 to more than 60 millimeter. More than 100 is not required. So the aim is to keep it between 60 and 100 millimeter of mercury. We try to avoid giving more than 50% of oxygen more than 24 hours. The potential complication of giving a patient with a respiratory failure, giving oxygen, if in some conditions, this will uh, lead to uh, hypercapnia. 
So we'll observe the PO2 saturation and carbon dioxide. I will not go in details regarding methods of oxysolventation, but I will only, uh, I want to stress on the point of this uh, one, if we give oxygen from an oxygen source, say it will uh, give one, two, five liters per minute, six liters, whatever. This is from the supply, it is 100% oxygen. But regarding what the patient receives, we cannot guarantee the percent of oxygen uh, because it sometimes it is mixed with air, whatever the device you use, uh, and it depends on the patient effort. So how much the flow is coming to the patient, how much oxygen, uh, air, uh, oxygen is uh, diluted with air, and how big is the patient's effort to uh, take this oxygen supply. So we cannot know exactly except in some uh, uh, devices what the percent of oxygen given. It depends on the flow rate and the patient's inspiratory flow rate. I will not go in details about the oxygen devising devices. Uh, they have classifications, they are different types. So we'll go directly to the uh, our topic. Uh, after uh, giving the patients to, uh, a chance to breathe uh, oxygen, uh, we will um, assess uh, uh, PO2, oxygen saturation, and the carbon dioxide tension. If we, the, there is no response, means I didn't achieve the PO2 of more than 60, 60 or more millimeter mercury, or if there is a carbon dioxide retention that is uh, more than 60 millimeter mercury in 30 minutes, so this is significant retention. This is the case that we have to ventilate the patient. If the patient is a, a good candidate for uh, non-invasive ventilation, we we'll start it. If not, because it is contraindicated in some conditions, so we'll start mechanical ventilation. The indications to start mechanical ventilation is failure of oxygen therapy, that is PO2 less than 60, or carbon dioxide retention associated with reduction in pH, respiratory muscle fatigue, loss of protective upper airway reflexes, uh, reduced airway patency, ineffective cough with excessive secretions, and the uh, diminished level of consciousness. So this patient should be intubated and mechanically ventilated. Mechanical ventilation is simply giving oxygen and air in a certain volume, in a certain, this volume is achieved by a certain frequency and tidal volume. And uh, we have to adjust the FIO2 uh, that's suitable for the, each patient. Uh, how to achieve these uh, uh, settings by using a certain mode of ventilation and uh, we adjust times of inspiration and expiration. The relationship between inspiration and expiration depends on the uh, ventilator type. It is in seconds, it is in percent or in a ratio between both of them. Regarding mode of ventilation, don't uh, take much time to think of the mood and the initial settings. Uh, later on, we'll discuss uh, what, is, what should be known about the mood. But the basics of mechanical condition are much, much more important than thinking about the moods. Uh, mechanism of action of the ventilator, it, uh, it, it is uh, uh, working or uh, uh, giving ventilation in four phases. Inspiratory phase and expiratory phase are the main components. In between uh, inspiration and expiration, there should be cycling. Cycling from inspiration to expiration, we call it expiratory cycling, and the other one is called inspiratory cycling. The whole process depends on variables, four variables. That These variables are pressure, volume, flow, and time. For each of these four variables, it will give the uh, sufficient volume or sufficient time or sufficient flow or sufficient uh, pressure according to the mode of ventilation that we need. The respiratory cycle is presented in the, by the these two arrows making a circle on the left side. That uh, The yellow one is the inspiration and the blue one is the expiration and the vertical lines are the cycling times. Look at the circle on the right side. Sometimes 
we apply what is called inspiratory pause that we in, in which we stop not we the ventilator will stop flow for a certain time this time is actually part of the inspiratory time so the inspiratory time starts from the at the end of expiration here and this one is the only is only the inspiratory flow time flow time flow stops for a certain time we call it inspiratory pause it is calculated as a part of the whole inspiratory time this is important later on we will see why it is important to understand mechanical ventilation we have to have a look on the pressure uh, values in the respiratory system uh, we live um, if we are in uh, at uh, sea level we have our barometric pressure surrounding us, or atmospheric pressure that is 760 millimeter of mercury. We'll call, we will refer it to as a barometric pressure or atmospheric pressure. We will convert this 760 millimeter of mercury, we will say it is zero. So any value below 760 is minus, and if it is more, hundred, uh, more than 760, it is plus. This 760 is, is, uh, 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 will be more if we go less, uh, below the uh, sea level or it is less if we go uh, above the sea level. So we will uh, take this value as uh, upper airway or mouth or airway opening or proximal airway or atmospheric pressure that is outside or inside the mouth. The other one, next one, is if we go through the conducting system, then we would go to the alveolar uh, pressure, that is uh, intrapulmonary or lung pressure or alveolar pressure. This is usually with uh, spontaneous breathing, it will be minus one to plus one, minus one centimeter of water during inspiration, plus one during expiration. This is a normal quiet breathing. Uh, if the patient takes forceful inspiration, it will be minus two, minus three, minus four. Forceful expiration, it will be plus one, plus two, plus three, and so on. The third pressure is the pulmonary, uh, is the pleural, sorry, pleural pressure, pleural, in the pleural cavity between the parietal and visceral pleura. It is negative 10 centimeters of water during quiet inspiration and negative five centimeter water during expiration so it is always negative the pressure applied to the body from outside is the body surface pressure and we uh, here we will not uh, talk about it in in uh, invasive mechanical ventilation this uh, graph represents the changes in uh, alveolar pressure in the above uh, uh, curve in the upper curve this horizontal line that is the mouse pressure or, barom or the atmospheric pressure that is zero centimeter of water during inspiration the alveolar pressure will be minus one in inspiration and plus one centimeter water during expiration so inspiration expiration and the intrapleural pressure will follow it in the same way but with negative and negative five during inspiration and expiration. During mechanical ventilation, there will be no negative pressure unless the patient is, has some spontaneous effort. So if we, if we apply controlled mechanical ventilation, that, that means that we give muscle relaxant uh, plus sedation, so there will be no patient effort. The, the pressure uh, and the airway pressure will be always positive during inspiration and during expiration. And the intrapleural pressure will be less negative. It will be minus five during inspiration and plus five during expiration. Later on, we'll see the, the importance of these pressure changes. For the gas to, to, to pass from any part in the respiratory system to another part, so there should be a pressure gradient so pressure gradients, so uh, the, pre the flow should pass from the higher pressure area to lower pressure area. 
the pressure difference between the upper airway and the alveolar pressure is called trans airway pressure. The pressure gradient from the between the alveolar pressure and the pleural pressure is called trans pulmonary pressure. The first one is trans airway and second one is trans pulmonary. The pressure gradient between the alveolar pressure and the outside pressure is called trans thoracic. So for air con uh, conduction, we look at the trans airway pressure. For alveolar inflation, we look at the trans pulmonary pressure. The parameters of ventilation include FiO2, the initial setting is 100 or 1, 100% or 1 as a fraction. The tidal volume, the frequency, we use, I have used a small F4 in my lecture. A minute volume, IA ratio, flow rate, flow profile, and the triggering sensitivity. To understand, everybody knows what is tidal volume, what is frequency. What is minute volume? That is a product of multiplying frequency by tidal volume. Uh, and I ratio that there is a relationship between inspired time and expired time. All this will be discussed in detail later on. I will start with the flow rate to facilitate uh, what will be uh, introduced later on. To start with this one, uh, if uh, you see this uh, volume, volume, time, curve that is displayed on the ventilator uh, screen. Volume means uh, the tidal volume, the peak of this curve is the tidal volume. In this patient, we are giving 500 milliliter. This limb is the inspiratory limb. So this is the inspiratory time from this point to this point. So the inspiratory time here is half second, half second. The other limb going down is the expiratory limb. The time of expiration is from 0.5 to 3 seconds, so it is 2.5 seconds. So the green, the sorry, the red, the red graph represents a volume time scalar showing the patient breathing with 500 milliliter of tidal volume, the inspiratory time of a half second, and the expiratory time is 2.5 seconds. So the IA ratio here is 1 to 5. If I want to change this ratio to prolong the inspiratory time and reduce the time of expiration, I will increase the inspiratory flow rate. If I increase the inspiratory flow rate, this means that shorter time is, uh, uh, so, sorry, if I reduce, sorry, uh, if reduce, the first one, the red one is 60 liters per minute, the inspiratory flow rate. If I reduce this flow rate to six to thirty, so this means that more time, more time is given to inspiration, reducing, halving the flow rate from six to thirty, results in doubling the inspiratory time from 0.5 seconds to one second. If we keep the respiratory rate with no change, this means that its expiratory time will be reduced from 2.5 seconds to only two seconds. The final in the blue one, the final result is that in decreasing the inspiratory flow rate means that the inspiratory time is increased and expiratory time is decreased. In this example, the higher ratio would be one to two. So this, this is the effect of manipulating the inspiratory flow rate. The reverse also exists. Increasing the inspiratory flow rate will result in the following. If we observe the peak in inspiratory pressure changes, or the uh, uh, pressure changes, against time, the three curves here represent changes in inspiratory flow rate. The normal situation, is the one in the middle. Increasing the inspiratory flow rate means increasing the airway pressure, will result in increasing the airway pressure, 
and the reduction of the inspiratory time. Decreasing the respiratory, inspiratory flow rate it will give the uh, opposite results of reducing the pressure and increasing the inspiratory time. This is important in patients who have, who have high pressure during mechanical ventilation. It, uh, the application of this uh, graph will be presented later on. I will uh, explain what is meant by the pressure changes, but uh, this curve shows the uh, changes, the effect of changing the inspiratory flow rate on the mean airway pressure. The red one is uh, one with highest flow rate, the green one is the middle value of inspiratory flow rate, and the blue one is the lowest inspiratory flow rate. I said it will decrease, increase, decreasing the flow rate will decrease the airway pressure, but the effect, its effect on uh, mean pressure, uh, we need to understand what is called uh, mean airway pressure. It, we have many equations to calculate. Don't worry about uh, the details, but factors affecting the mean airway pressure are the, the frequency, the time, peak and respiratory pressure, and peak values in two different ways. Regarding the inspiratory waveforms, we have four, ty four types of inspiratory waveform, and only the expiration is always the same uh, shape. This one, this curve is the flow time curve. Uh, previous one was, uh, uh, I said uh, before, that we have different uh, scalars that are pressure time, volume time, flow time, and this is the one of flow time. Here, this zero line represents no flow. Uh, it means that the uh, flow sensor uh, senses that there is no flow, so it will give zero value. With flow from the ventilator to, towards the patient, it will give a positive, positive wave. This means that this is inspiration. After inspiration, the ventilator stops flowing, and the flow will pass from the patient to the ventilator in the opposite way. So the ventilator will give a negative wave. So the, the wave above zero is the inspiration, and the wave below zero is the expiration. This is the wave form. During controlled mechanical ventilation with volume control, the wave and spread wave form will be in this shape that we call constant or square wave, square wave form, inspiration. During Pressure controlled ventilation due to the ventilator mechanics and lung mechanics, the waveform will be will be called decelerating. The inspiratory form is decelerating. It will be in the maximum flow rate, then decelerating to the end of uh, inspiration. Uh, another waveforms are the accelerating and the sinusoidal. Don't worry about this. So the this is the flow wave form. In some recent ventilators, I said that if we give volume controlled ventilation, it will give a constant inspiratory flow wave form. If we give pressure controlled, it will give this uh, shape, decelerating wave form. In some new ventilators, I can adjust the wave form, uh, whatever the mode of ventilation, because each each one of these wave form has its own effects on oxygen exchange, gas exchange, and hemodynamics. So. Uh, to, uh, this needs uh, more explanation. There is no time for this, but I can choose whatever uh, waveform. The waveforms are, as I said, the scalars, that's pressure time, flow time, and volume time. And the others are uh, loops, that is the relationship between, not uh, against time, but between two of the uh, variables, uh, volume uh, pressure or pressure volume curve, volume flow curve, and flow uh, pressure curve. This is a, these are the four curves uh, that are seen during uh, volume controlled ventilation. This is the flow curve, inspiration, expiration. This is the airway pressure changes with peak here. This is, the, uh, and the third one is volume. During volume control. During pressure control, the waveform of flow is decelerating. The airway pressure has no peak because the pressure is controlled. 
it is limited. So it, this one will not be peaked. It will give a horizontal line and the flow, uh, the volume curve is the same. The ventilation cycle passes into three parts, the triggering, limiting, and cycle. Triggering is, means what initiates the ventilation stroke. If the patient is spontaneously breathing, so will it, he will be the one to initiate or to trigger. And this depends on the flow or pressure flow or pressure, flow or pressure by the patient's effort. The patient himself will trigger the mode, the, the ventilation uh, cycle uh, that we will, we will adjust the mode according to different factors. If the patient uh, is not having spontaneous breathing effort sufficiently enough, or if we give controlled ventilation by applying a muscle relaxants, so the, the, the uh, triggering will be controlled by the machine. Machine controlled. If it is machine controlled, it depends on pressure, volume, flow, or time according to the mode of ventilation. This is the triggering uh, point. Now the ventilator is giving the patient something should limit what is given from the ventilator to the patient. The limiting factor or the target is achieved by either pressure volume or flow according to the mode of ventilation. Then we'll wait for cycling. Cycling depends on a target, uh, depends on a factor or variable. That's also is pressure, volume, time, or flow. As I said before, during spontaneous uh, breathing, the airway pressure changes are negative during inspiration and most during expiration. If we get uh, the patient muscle relaxant, everything will be controlled. This is the display of the patient uh, spontaneous breathing. This is the airway pressure changes, zero minus plus. And this is the sinusoidal waveform of spontaneous breathing, inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. During uh, controlled mechanical ventilation, the, there is no negative this is the volume control. There is no negative uh, wave. So the ventilator starts to give the patient uh, ventilation. So this is a part of uh, an inspiratory flow. It starts from here. During an inspiratory flow, the pressure increases until it reaches the maximum pressure. This is the pressure time curve. So the maximum pressure is called P max or peak inspiratory pressure. At this point, the ventilator stops ventilation for some time. This time is called pause time. Pause means no stop, no flow. At this time, no flow. There is no flow, so there is no resistance. There is no uh, pressure increase. And the volume given to the patient will be distributed to the terminal parts of the lung and will be redistributed from alveoli with low compliance to alveoli with high compliance. The alveoli don't have the same compliance. The pressure inside the alveoli is different according to their compliance. The alveoli with low compliance have high pressure and the alveoli with low compliance, the uh, high compliance have uh, low pressure. So the peak pressure is the sum of these pressures, but with no flow, and the alveoli are interconnected, so there is a chance for the pressure or the or the gas to redistribute it from higher alveoli, higher uh, pressure alveoli to lower pressure, so that there is a reduction of pressure. This reduction will reach a value that we call it post pressure or plateau pressure. It is a horizontal line, no more flow, only redistribution. So this uh, uh, reduction is important. It, it will give us uh, uh, some uh, certain uh, idea about the lung compliance and later on we'll uh, discuss it. Uh, then after uh, this inspiratory pause, uh, the patient uh, having uh, the chance to expire, so the pressure will be reduced from the plateau pressure to reach the end expiratory pressure. So this is the end of inspiration, expiration, zero end expiratory pressure. This is the inspiratory time and this is the expiratory time. This is the peak in expiratory pressure, the plateau pressure, and the difference is called trans-airway pressure. 
sorry for interruption, Prof. I know it's long lecture, but we are four minutes behind time, so we are allowed for a couple of so, minutes. Thanks. So, okay. Uh, this is a uh, 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 live display of the scalars and loops. Uh, this will take time, so I'll stop here because now I give the uh, control uh, our parameters of ventilation, I explained, but I need to uh, give uh, some information about if we change any of these parameters uh, and keep the others, so what is the effect of changing the parameters? Uh, I think it's better to stop now. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, all the lecturers uh, and all the attendees uh, for your uh, time. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we have uh, five or ten minutes, Dr. Walid, for the discussion. Uh, yes, it's five to ten minutes with each uh, speaker. Uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Saad Mahdi. Uh, we have uh, some questions. Uh, it was written in the questions and the answers. Is it appropriate to prescribe medications during the time of preoperative assessment or better to refer the patient to a specialist for appropriate assessment and management plan? Okay. Um... I answer that here. Um, is it appropriate to prescribe medication during time of preoperative assessment or better to refer to the patient? Especially, I said that uh, if you are able to do the prescription precisely right, you go ahead, like for example, if you can write uh, bronchodilator, uh, nebulizer, but you are not supposed to write anti-tuberculous drugs, you know, just as it's very important to follow your speciality. Uh, sometimes we can write some diuretics, uh, but if the patient needs to be manipulated as anti-diabetic drugs or the patient to adjust uh, the anticoagulant, uh, I, I, myself, I usually write uh, the low nuclear with heparin for bridging, and I have the protocol which is developed locally in our hospital. The next uh, question is ECG is requested only if the patient is above 60 years. Before that, not important if no medical problems present? Well, the, the most important before um, writing the protocol or anything, every single patient should be individualized. If the patient is uh, even 20 years old, and complaining of chest pain or whatever, we start now to see uh, cardiac ischemia in age of 30 or 35. So if, the, if you, every single patient should be individualized, but usually a patient, uh, adult uh, male or female, they have certain age according to the protocol. So uh, above 50, I request the ECG for uh, uh, men and above uh, 45 for ladies. Uh, okay, so uh, the next question is uh, about the uh, diabetes mellitus and okay. the time to check the uh, blood sugar uh, pre-operative and post-operative for the uh, diabetic patient. Yeah, we uh, as before, if the patient, we it is it is a pleasure to be sure that your patient is normal glycemic. And you can't know that before or without being checking your blood sugar. So it is uh, every single patient or diabetic patient coming to the uh, very operative setting, you should know about his uh, fasting blood sugar before going to surgery. And it will be nice to know what his blood sugar after surgery. 
طيب uh, patient the second uh, the next question is patient with high risk of PE is IBC filter a mandatory preoperative? Uh, of course, uh, and uh, that is a, a consultation between the analysis and the surgeon and the hematologist and in the same time intervention radiology and usually uh, infusion of kappa filter is uh, very important and uh, minimizing the risk of pulmonary impulses. Uh, the last question is uh, about the PACER. Uh, is the PACER programming pre-operative? Uh, is it the, the anesthetist job or uh, how can we do it like no, this? No, uh, unfortunately uh, you have to arrange with the cardiac cath lab or cardiac technician to come down to uh, the very operative setting and the uh, change that. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Saad Mahdi, for the very nice lecture and for the uh, questions. Uh, and thank you very much. And uh, before leaving, I would like to uh, thank you again and uh, all organizing committee, Dr. Walid and Dr. Walid, and all the uh, uh, participants today and all the attendants. And uh, I enjoyed uh, joining Dr. Rafat uh, very much. And uh, thank you very much, very well. Thank you. The same here. Thank you very much, Dr. Saad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, now the questions for uh, the second lecture for Dr. Rafat. And um, uh, how to manage flow, starvation, pressure moods. Uh, can I start now? As I said, this is uh, the whole lecture is about the principle of mechanical ventilation. So I will not go to advanced modes of ventilation. I will uh, be concentrating on only the basics. Uh, regarding uh, flow starvation, I see only uh, another question here. Yeah, about the trigger. We have a question uh, about... About obstructive airway disease. And I will the... answer this one first. Uh, okay. In obstructive airway disease, after adjusting rate and IE, how much beep we can use. In obstructive airway disease, we don't use beep. In obstructive airway disease, we need time for the obstructed airway to be, to have, uh, <coughs> uh, to give a chance to the flow. So we'll reduce, reduce the rate of, actually, of uh, respiration. So the cycle, instead of being 12 or 14, it will be 10 or uh, only eight. First step is reducing the rate. The second step is to prolong the expiratory time. So we'll adjust the IE ratio to be one to three, one to four, or one to five. No PIB is applied. This is the answer for this question. Uh, I can see the other question. Uh, Dr. Hisham, what is the other question? The other question is, uh, what is the trigger in the anesthesia machine ventilator? Yeah, an anesthesia machine ventilator, Usually, we give muscle relaxants and we control ventilation. So there is no triggering by the patient. The trigger is only by the ventilator. It, it depends on the, uh, on the mode. I have two modes. The main modes are volume control and the other one is pressure control. For volume control, I adjust the rate. So according to the rate, it will be time triggering. The rate, uh, for example, if the rate is 10, this means that the respiratory cycle is six seconds. So each six seconds, that is the ventilator will, will be triggered by the machine in volume control. And pressure control, it is the same. Uh, I adjust the rate. So according to the rate, if it is uh, the same also, 10, every 10 seconds, every six seconds, it will trigger. So the, uh, in, during controlled ventilation, it is, machine triggered and in volume control and pressure control, it is time triggering. If uh, at the end of, uh, of the operation, I will uh, um, give a chance to the patient to start his own uh, respiratory effort and I will change the mode to SIMV or pressure support. With SIMV or pressure support, the patient will be the one triggering. Uh, there is a triggering window. It will sense the patient flow or pressure and according to the settings that I adjust, it will trigger. So the patient will trigger, and then its IMV, it will be synchronized with the machine, so it will not allow the patient to 
to be given. It will not give the patient unless he is inspiring or there is no effort. If there is expiration, the ventilator will wait until the expiration ends and it will give the stroke. In pressure support ventilation, the patient effort initiates the ventilator to give flow until it reaches the preset value of pressure. This is my answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Ralph. you. Thank you, Dr. Saad Mahdi. Thank you. Dr. Walid, Dr. Walid, and thanks for all the attendees. We enjoyed very much the lectures, Thank and you. we are thanking everyone for the precious time, for the effort, and for uh, everything. Uh, and we will be waiting everyone uh, the next Monday for the next session in uh, our uh, mega online free course. Thank you, everyone, and have blessed Ramadan. Thank you. 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 Thank you.